thank you, Ty and, uh, Andre, 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 for that beautiful song. This world is crumbling, isn't it? You can sense it, you can feel it. But we have Jesus. It means everything. And thank you, Dernita, for that wonderful story, children's story. Oh, losing a tooth was traumatic at that age. I'm sure it'd be traumatic now. <laughs> and Randy, thank you so much for your prayer and your leadership in this church. You just sense there's a coming crisis. You can feel it. You can just sense it in the, in the news and the events taking place. Before we begin, let's pray. O oh, gracious Father in heaven, you have told us that the end times will not be easy. And we recognize that. You've also told us that you will be present that you will be with us. You will guide us day by day through whatever comes our way. Lord, bless us now as we study your word. May it give us the extra, extra tools to be ready for your coming, I pray. Amen. Let's see. Jesus gave a warning to his disciples. It was just before he was, just at the end of his ministry. He said this, but at that day and hour, no one knows. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Notice he said that to his disciples, the ones who he was closest to. Here's another text. Therefore be ye ready, also ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. What I say to you, I say to all. Watch. Why did he say that? Because he did not want his disciples to be sleeping. He does not want us to be sleeping. Were Christ's disciples in danger of sleeping? Are we in danger of sleeping? Mark Finley, in his last quarter's Sabbath school lesson, it was about Revelation. He wrote something interesting that got my attention. You know, as Adventists, we know a lot about end time events. But look at what he said. Lest we pride ourselves on our knowledge of Bible truth and believe that we are in no immediate danger from such blatant deceptions... Think again. Think again. Now, we are blessed. We do have a lot of knowledge. But the last day deceptions will be so subtle that unless we understand the word carefully, even we could be in danger. Amen? Now, I want to just do a brief review I know you know these things, but I want to just do a brief review of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, we know, you're familiar with this, we had the four world kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, then we have Europe, and then we see the stone that comes, that's the coming of Jesus, strikes the image. That's Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 7 has the same sequence, Right? You have the lion that represents Babylon. You have the bear that represents Persia. You have the, the leopard with four heads and two pairs of wings that represents Greece. And then you have this 
dragon like creature that Daniel couldn't even describe, and it represented Rome. Same sequence. So you've heard this before, but I want to repeat it. The book, the chapters in Daniel repeat and enlarge. The purpose of every, ch every chapter is to bring out new information. It doesn't contradict what went before. It just enlarges upon it. Daniel chapter 8, for example, zeroes in on a conflict between Persia and Greece. Of course, Greece wins. But it also takes us to the second coming of Jesus. So if you look at Daniel chapter 2, 7, 8, and 9, you have this principle, this principle that says they all predict world events from the time of the prophet until the second coming of Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. My question to you is, what about Daniel 11? What about Daniel 11? Daniel 11 is the most detailed of all the chapters. Does it follow that same pattern? Well, let's find out. Let's go to Daniel, chap Daniel 11, chapter 11, verse 2. Gabriel is speaking to Daniel, and he says, Now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. Why doesn't he mention Babylon? Why not Babylon? It's already gone. That's an important concept to remember. The, the angel speaks to Daniel at the time he's speaking, dealing with the kingdom at that time. Now we know, and then it says, the, fall, the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Now let's unpack this a little bit. This is talking about Persia. This vision takes place during the reign of Cyrus. Darius the Mede was already dead. Cyrus had taken over. Three kings would follow Cyrus. And we know who they are. Cambyses, small, Paul Smyrtis, and Darius I. Now Darius I was the one who issued a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. You can find that in Ezra chapter 6. Very important king. But the fourth Persian king was Xerxes, or Ahasuerus. And who was Ahasuerus? He was the husband of Esther. That's right. Very, very important king. He was wealthy. If you read, if you go to Esther, uh, yeah, Esther 1, chapter 1, verse 4, it says he, he held this big party to the to display the riches of his kingdom. He had a whole year. Now, Xerxes ruled a vast empire. The empire of Persia was bigger than Babylon. It was huge. But he wasn't satisfied. Does that sound familiar? He had a huge empire, but he wasn't satisfied. He wanted the whole world. And there was one country that was independent, and he was unhappy. He wanted to conquer that country. So what he did was he, he, he gathered an enormous army of 300,000. He marched on Greece to, to conquer it. He had some success initially, but he was eventually beaten back. Then we come to Greece, verse 3. A mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Who do you think that is? Alexander the Great. And all Bible students and historians, they all agree. There's no disagreement about this. This is Alexander the Great. See, what happened was Persia was always attacking Greece. And the people of Greece were upset about that, as you can imagine. The problem was that Greece was divided. The Spartans and Athenians were always fighting. They were very divided, so they weren't united. Alexander the Great succeeded in partially uniting the kingdom of Greece, the Macedonia, with the, 
with uh, Athena, Athens, and he took an army of 40 or 50,000 men and marched them, across, marched them into Asia Minor. And in just a little over three and a half years, he won three amazing battles. The Battle of Granicus, the Battle of Isis, the Battle of Guacamela. And he conquered the entire Persian Empire, destroyed the armies of the Persians. Three, just a little over three years. Amazing, absolutely amazing feat. But Greece breaks up because Alexander the Great died at the age of 33, and most historians think it was a combination of alcohol and malaria. Very young. And it, the, the prophecy says that when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided towards the four winds of heaven. But not among his posterity. He did not give his kingdom to a son. What happened was his kingdom was broken up and it was divided to his four generals. And we know who they were. Ptolemy took the south, Egypt and Libya. Lysimachus took the north. Cassander took the west, which was mostly Greece. Seleucus took the east, which was mostly Syria, Iran, and Iraq. Now, these four generals in time, they consolidated into two kingdoms a northern Greek kingdom and a southern Greek kingdom. And that's where we get to verse 5. Verse 5 talks about the kings of the north and the kings of the south. That's where this comes from. The, the Seleucids were in the north, the Ptolemies were in the south. So we have the king of the north, which is countries and kingdoms north of Jerusalem. We have the king of the south, which is countries and kingdoms south of Jerusalem. And they're both evil. Okay? They're both evil. Now, don't, be conf don't confuse this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south with Armageddon. They're not the same. The battle of Armageddon is the battle between good and evil. Christ and his kingdom against the forces of devil. Jerusalem is in the middle. Now, verses 5 through 15 describe the conflict between these two Greek kings. The one in the north, the Seleucids. The one in the south, the Ptolemies. By the way, the kings in the north are either called Antiochus or, uh, or uh, Seleuc Seleuc Seleucids. Seleucids. The kings in the south are always called Ptolemies. So it gets confusing because they got, they got so many Ptolemies when you, when you study it. But verses 5 through 15 are about the conflict, and it's very, very interesting. I have a whole seminar I do on these verses. But I'm not going to go into detail this morning, because it would take hours. Okay? But, it's, but the interesting part is most historians agree on the interpretation of verses 5 to 15. Most. Then you come to imperial Rome in verses 16 through 30. Now, does that sound familiar? Isn't that the same sequence we have in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel 7? Right? Now, I want, to sh I want to take a moment to prove to you that Rome, imperial Rome, is in these verses. Daniel eleven nineteen, 19. He, Julius Caesar shall turn his face towards the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Julius Caesar was a, was a member of the triumvirate. You know, there was Crassius, there was Pompey, and there was Julius Caesar. Well, Crassius was killed in, in a campaign against the Parthians. That left Pompey and Julius Caesar. Well, they didn't like each other. Julius Caesar wanted to be king. He wanted to be the emperor. So he marched. Now he was fighting wars in France. They call the Gallic Wars from about 59 BC to about 50 BC. And he won tremendous victories fighting the Germans. 
And it really increased his status, stature among the Romans. So he decided he wanted to be the emperor. He says, forget this triumvirate, I'm going to be the emperor. So he marched on Rome. And he fought a battle against Pompey and he destroyed Pompey and his armies. You ever heard of crossing the Rubicorn? That's Julius Caesar. When he crossed the Rubicorn, there was no turning back. He was either going to conquer or perish. And he conquered. He won. However, Rome, up to this time, had been a republic. They had had a representative government. And many people in the Senate, which was a ruling body, did not want a dictatorship. They did not want an emperor. They wanted to maintain the republic. So they realized that Julius Caesar was bound and determined to be the emperor, and so they murdered him on the Ides of March. March 15, 44 BC, right in the Senate. Right in the Senate. That's why it says, he shall stumble and fall. Notice, notice it says, he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land. That's his return to Rome. And then it says, he shall stumble and fall. And that's how he stumbled by assassination. Now look at Daniel, look at the next verse. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the kingdom. Who followed Julius Caesar as emperor? Augustus. We got some history students here. Did he ever impose a tax? Absolutely. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. That's why Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem to be taxed. You see how this, you see how history fulfills this prophetic, these prophetic verses? It's amazing. Look at the next verse. There shall arise in his place a vile person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. What happened after Augustus died? Well, his, 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 first, his real name was Octavian. He did not have a son, but his wife Livia did. He married her. She had a son by another marriage. Livia wanted Tiberius, her son, to be the emperor. But Octavian didn't like Tiberius. He thought he was too vile a person to become the emperor. But through intrigue, through, through machinations of Livia, he became the emperor. He came in peaceably. But notice it says they will not give him the honor of royalty. He was a vile person. And the Romans did not like him. When he died, they had a party all night long celebrating his death. Let me tell you how, how, how evil he was. Now, he, he was a good general. He was a good general. He, he waged wars in the east and was very successful. But he didn't like to be emperor, so he would retreat to an island off the west coast of, of Italy. I probably shouldn't even, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm, I'm going to trust you to handle it right. He would have little boys brought to him. And after he had molested and had sex with them, he would throw them over the cliff to their death. And he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. That's how evil he was. So you see how he fits the prophecy? A vile person? They will not give the honor of royalty? It's a fit. This is talking about imperial Rome. These verses are talking about imperial Rome. Now look at the next verse. With the force of a flood, they opposition, all opposition to Tiberius will be swept away. By the way, flood here in Daniel and, other, and in Daniel 9 means violence. Violence. With the force of a flood, all opposition will be swept away from before him and be broken. Also, the prince of the covenant. Who's the prince of the covenant? There's only one person that's the prince of the covenant. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with, with, you know, with, with, the, with the Jews. He made a covenant with us. It's a fact. Jesus was crucified under the reign of Tiberius. 
perfect fulfillment. I love this verse. It is one of those verses there's no argument. In my mind, there's no argument about this verse. This represents Jesus. Yes, yes. Hundreds of years before it happened. So, again, there's, more, there's a lot more in these verses to talk about, and I don't have time to do that, but I just wanted you to realize, see, that imperial Rome follows Greece in Daniel 11. Does that make sense? Okay. And I would suggest to you, and, and there, are different, there are different interpretations on some of these verses, and I get that, and some of them are a little bit, you know, you could take them different ways. But the facts are, imperial Rome follows Greece in, in Daniel 11. But what followed imperial Rome? What followed imperial Rome? Papal Rome. Papal Rome. That's exactly what you find in Daniel 7. You don't see it in Daniel 2 because it didn't go into those details. But you see it in Daniel 7 and you see it in Daniel 8. Papal Rome. Yes. So Daniel 11 follows the same sequence of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 9. Doesn't that make sense? Folks, when you understand that, Daniel 11 isn't as complicated as you might, it might appear to be. Once you get that big picture, that big pattern in mind. Now, I want to share with you some verses from Daniel 30, 11, 31 through 39. And I want you to tell me what you think. Look, listen to these verses. Daniel eleven thirty one, 31. And forces shall be mustered by him, Vatican Rome, and they, the armies of the Vatican, shall defile the sanctuary. Now, Rome has always used the armies of the state to accomplish their purposes. Always has done that. So they use the armies of the state and they defiled the sanctuary. How did Rome, people Rome defile the sanctuary? They taught people to pray to the departed saints. They taught people to pray to Mary. They taught people to confess their sins to the priest. Who do we confess our sins to? Jesus. He's in the sanctuary in heaven. They defiled that sanctuary by taking the people's faith and hope away from him. And there's an, in the second part of the verse, it says, they shall take away the daily sacrifice. You know, they had a, you know, in the Old Testament, they had a sacrifice in the morning and they had a sacrifice in the evening. And both were times of repentance and forgiveness. Papal Rome took it away. Today, we have the privilege of every morning and every evening coming before the Lord as our high priest, receiving forgiveness, receiving grace. But it gets worse. This power was not satisfied just with false teachings. They wanted to destroy those that held the truth. And we have our martyrs, Daniel 11 through 33. Those who understand shall instruct many. Yet, in many days they shall fall by the sword, by the flame, by captivity, by plundering. The, the, those who understand are God's true people, the remnant inside the Roman Empire. Now this agrees exactly with what Daniel 7.21 says. The same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. One of the saddest verses in the Bible this evil power was making war with God's people, and they were winning. Oh. When I first read that 40 years ago, I said, Lord, why? And this power exalts itself above every god. That's exactly this, almost the same wording as in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, where it says, the son of perdition, who exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. And Protestants have always understood 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 to mean Vatican Rome. So same power. Not only that, not only did they persecute, they, it blasphemes. 
Daniel 11, 36. And then the king of the north shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods. Same, almost the same as thir- Revelation 13, 5. The sea beast was giving them out, speaking great things and blasphemies. This is a description of the reign of papal Rome for 1,260 years. Verses 39 through 39 give a detailed description of papal Rome's history from 538 to 1798. Long time. It represents 1,260 years of papal domination and persecution. Now, I want to emphasize this 1,260 year period in Bible prophecy is very prominent. It's very significant. It's mentioned seven times in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Seven times. So, this covers a long period of time, and it's very significant. What, what time period, what does the Bible call the time period after the 1,260 years? Time of the end. Exactly right. That's where we get to verse 40. At the time of the end. 1798 was the was the terminal date, terminal year for the 1,260 years, and then begins the time of the end. Now, some Adventists will say, well, wasn't that 1844? Well, 1844 happened in the time of the end, but it's the terminal date for the 2,300-year day prophecy. Okay? So at the time of the end, we're talking about 1798. We're talking about a specific year. Now, I, I, I discovered something that was very fascinating. That word end in Hebrew is kates. And whenever that word, kates, is associated with a period of time, it means exactly that time. Let me give you an example. Exodus 12:41. It says, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end, kates, Hebrew word kates, of the 430 years on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So my point is, this is precise. It's pointing to a specific year. Not 1805, not 1900, not 2000, 1798. What happens? What happened in 1798? Well, folks, this is amazing. The king of the south attacks the king of the north. And the king of the north counterattacks against the king of the south. Now that word attack, the Hebrew word for that is nagash. Nagash. And it means to gore. To gore. So what we're... What this, what this is describing is a conflict to the death. The king of the south is determined to destroy the king of the north. Not coexist, eliminate it. Destroy it. Well, who is the king of the north? Well, we just saw verses 31 through 39. Say it was that in that papal Rome. We can say with a high degree of certainty 
that the king of the north in verse 40 is papal Rome. And most, almost, I don't know of anybody who disagrees with this. No Adventist, but scholar would disagree with this. So that's pretty clear. But who is the king of the south? That's what I want to sh- take some time and share with you. Now the king of the south is represented by Egypt in the beginning and at the end. And all, most, every, every, every research I've looked at doesn't, doesn't disagree with this, agrees with this. It's Egypt in the beginning, it's Egypt at the end. In the beginning of Daniel 11, Egypt is the literal country of Egypt. Right? Everybody agree? At the end, Egypt is a symbol, not literal. Folks, when we get into the end times, we can't be literal. Babylon is not literal today. Babylon is nothing today. You know? Uh, <laughs> the image of the beast is a symbol. They're all, it's all symbolic. Egypt is a symbol of a world power that tries to destroy Vatican Rome. Does it make sense? Are you with me? All right? The key to understanding is Revelation 11. And I want to, sh- I want to go through these, some verses here. Revelation 11.2 says, And they, papal Rome, will tread the holy city underfoot, that's God's people, and the heavenly sanctuary, for 42 months. There it is, 42 months. 1,260 days. 42 times 30. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, if you go on the internet and Google two witnesses, you'll get amazing interpretations of this. (laughs) I have to control myself and not laugh too much. It's amazing. You know, what did Jesus say? He said, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. Now when you testify, you are a witness. The scriptures are the witnesses. And that's exactly what our wonderful, wonderful prophet says in Great Controversy. The two witnesses represents the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. Everybody agree with that? All right. They will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth. That means mourning. And here's what, here's a commentary from the uh, Great Controversy. It says, when the Bible was prescribed by religious and secular authorities, when its testimony was perverted, and every, ever ma- every effort made to turn the minds of the people from the truth, when those who dared to proclaim its sacred truths were hunted, betrayed, tortured, buried in dungeon cells, martyred for their faith, the faithful witnesses prophesied in sackcloth. And they, when they are finishing their testimony, now when do they testify? From 538 to 1798 in sackcloth. When they are finishing their testimony, near the end, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now folks, this is a dramatic point in prophetic history. When in the history of of humanity in the history of the great controversy has has any power been able to overcome the word of God and kill it but there is a point in history sacred history where this actually happened actually able to overcome and kill the word of God this is amazing folks the significance of this cannot be overstated 
Great controversy. As they were approaching the termination of their work in obscurity, war was to be made upon them by the power represented as the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. Now, is a beast a good power or an evil power? Always evil. And it comes from the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit in Revelation is always associated with who? Satan. This is a satanic power. And it arises at a specific time. And here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. Now, was Satan exercising his power during the 1,260 years? Yes. But at the end, in 1798, something very different, dramatically different, arises. A satanic, a new satanic movement that had not been there before. This prophecy has received a most exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France. France. Now, France today is not a big power. But back in 1798, it was a world power. Heard of, ever heard of Napoleon? The world trembled when they heard that Napoleon was on the march. During, and, and what happened? The French Revolution. During the revolution, 1793, the world for the first time heard an assembly of men born and educated in civilization uplift a united voice and renounce unanimously, unanimously, belief and worship of a deity. This is something new. Folks, if you go back into ancient history, you find very few reference, very few people who espouse atheism. This is something very new. France is the only nation in the world concerning which the authentic record survives that as a nation she lifted her hand in open rebellion against the author of the universe. This is new. Just like the Bible predicted. Something new. And their dead bodies, the Old and New Testament, will lie in the streets of the great city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Now, when it says city, it means more than just a city. Just like Babylon refers to more than just a city, it refers to a whole empire and system. What happened during the French Revolution? Two things, in particular. They outlawed marriage, and they outlawed Christianity. So people engaged in the most gross promiscuity, uh, promiscuity and immorality. Well, that is similar to Sodom. But the other thing it did, it outlawed Christianity. It outlawed faith. And here's why. The French people had been under the control of Catholicism for centuries. And the cruelty of the church they associated with the Bible and God. And they rose up against that cruelty and threw it off. And when they did, they said, we don't believe in any God. Egypt, then, is identified here with that outlawing of Christianity. Atheism. Atheism, exactly. Then, from those people, tribes, tongues, and nations, they will see their dead bodies three and a half days. Three and a half days? A year for a day. Right? And will not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. That was the rule of atheism. Now, the, 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 the French Revolution lasted almost ten years. About ten years. From 1789 to about 1799. But there was a three-year period called the Reign of Terror. And it was a reign of terror. And it was three and a half years, just like the Bible said. The great, now this is, this is the commentary of Ellen White, great controversy. The great city in whose streets the witnesses are slain, where their dead bodies lie, is spiritually Egypt. Well, folks, here we have a, a decoding of the significance of Egypt in the end times. 
It, symbol, it symbolizes, it's a symbol of atheism. Of all nations presented in the Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. You see, we have to look at things from the, from the perspective of Scripture, not from the pers perspective of secular historians or the newspaper. The significance of Egypt in the, from the biblical perspective is that defiance of Pharaoh, defiance, no, defiance of God, Pharaoh's defiance of God. That's the significance of Egypt. No monarch ever ventured upon a more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven than did the king of Egypt. When the message was brought, was brought to him by Moses in the name of the Lord, Pharaoh proudly answered, Who is Jehovah that I should hearken unto his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Jehovah. Moreover, I will not let Israel go. And then, in this paragraph, is the next sentence. This is atheism. This is atheism. It is the definition of atheism. That defines. The atheistic movement of the French Revolution attacked the scriptures and belief in the existence of God. But it also attacked the king and the queen. Why? Because Louis XVI, who was ruling at that time, was reaching out to other countries of Europe saying, come help me against this rebellion that I have going on. This was a new thing. This was a rebellion. This was over, trying to overthrow the authority of the crown. So, it, so this atheistic movement attacked the royalty. Now, the Jacobins were the leaders of the French Revolution, and they became very upset with Louis XVI, and they executed him and his wife, Antoinette, Queen Antoinette. But they also became very angry with the clergy, the, 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 the Catholic clergy. Why? Because Vatican Rome was very upset about this French Revolution also, and they opposed it. And so the revolution turns their forces and their wrath upon the church. All too well, the people had learned the lessons of cruelty and torture, which Rome had so diligently taught. It was not now the disciples of Jesus that were thrust into dungeons and dragged to the stake. The scaffolds ran red with the blood of the priests. The galleys and the prisons, once crowded with Huguenots, were now filled with their persecutors. Chained to the bench and toiling at the oar, the Roman Catholic clergy experienced all those woes which their church had so freely inflicted upon the gentle heretics. And those heretics were the Huguenots, or Huguenots in the French term. So, the atheistic movement of the French Revolution first attacked the crown, the king and the queen. Then they attacked the Catholic clergy. But, and this is the most significant part, they also attacked something else. And what was that something else? Vatican Rome. In Rome. And I give you the proof. I a proof. I want to give you some a proof of this. In 1798, the Directory, which is a group of five men that held the executive power, these were the people that ran the country, ordered Napoleon to take to destroy, destroy Vatican Rome. A letter was written by two of the men of the Directory to Napoleon, who at that time was fighting the, the forces of Austria. Austria was their was their arch enemy, and they were fighting in Italy, and he was winning battles in Italy. He was, he was being successful. But I have a book, and I, I have it in my car, and it's in my library. It's a book written by A. Law Allard. He was contemporary uh, at the time of the French Revolution. He's French. This book had to be translated into English. But this is what he wrote. He was an eyewitness of the French Revolution. This is what he wrote, that... These directors wrote to Napoleon 
And they said, it is for you who unite in your person the most distinguished qualities of the general and of the enlightened politician to realize this aim if it's practicable. The Roman religion will always be the irreconcilable enemy of the Republic, the French Republic. It must be struck in France. They did. It must be struck in Rome. There is one thing even more essential to the attainment of the end desired, and that is to destroy, if possible, the center of unity of the Roman Church. You see, the leaders of the French Republic, of the, of the French Revolution, saw that the Catholic Church would destroy them. So it was either they, they destroy the church, or the church would destroy them. There was no place for both. Both movements could not exist. The Catholic movement or the atheistic movement could not coexist in this world. And of course, in response to these instructions, Napoleon, Napoleon sent his general, Berthier, to Rome to take the Pope prisoner. Now, we talk about this all the time in our evangelistic meetings, but what we don't say is the purpose. What was the purpose of taking the Pope prisoner? The purpose was to annihilate, to eliminate Catholic, the Catholicism from the face of the earth. It was to destroy Vatican Rome. There was no place for both movements. They will not coexist. And that's exactly what Revelation 13 tells us. I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. Now let's go back to Daniel 11.40. At the time of the end, what happened in 1798? Who attacked the king of the north? The French atheistic movement attacked in 1798, right on time. Exactly what, what the scripture said. The king of the south shall attack him. The king of the north shall come against him. Now notice, now notice as time goes on, the king of the north counterattacks. And notice what happens. He shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. Like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. This is total victory. The Bible pre predicts the prophecy says that in the final battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, the king of the north wins. Completely overwhelms the king of the south. King of the south started the fight, but the king of the north finishes it. Cleans their clock. There's nothing left of the king of the south before Jesus comes. So, I know that there are others, many, many, many people who, who also claim that the king of the south is, is Islam. I get that. Now, I lived in a Muslim country, and I have great respect for, for Islam and Muslim, and it was a powerful world movement, no question about it. And it had a very important purpose in, in, in the plan of salvation. But I want to tell you three reasons why it's not the king of the south. First of all, scripture. You know, we let the Bible explain itself, don't we? Yeah. Scripture says King of Egypt is associated with the atheism of the French Revolution. Revelation 11.8. Scripture. Scripture tells us who, who Egypt is in the end time. Number two, chronology. Chronology. The king of the south, the atheistic revolution of France attacked Vatican Rome right on time, 1798. Not 1800, not 1850, not 1900, not 2000. Right on time, at the time of the end. And number three, history. Yes, Islam was a powerful movement in the 1500s, 1600s. Suleiman made the world tremble. But by the time you get to 1798, the Ottoman Empire has become a disaster. They're just 
they become the laughing stock. Nobody is afraid of the Ottoman Empire in 1798. It was called the sick man of Europe in the, 18, in the early 1800s. Islam was not a threat to anybody. Not to Russia, not to Prussia, not to England, not to Austria, not to France. It was not a threat to anybody, and certainly not to Vatican Rome, in 1798. So it just doesn't make any sense to assign the King of the South to Islam. Now, I've taken quite a bit of time. Uh, I can stop here, and we can continue in the afternoon, or I can continue on another 10, 15 minutes. You tell me what you would like to do. You want to, you want to pause here? You, this is a lot of information, right? You want to keep going? OK. All right. <laughs> now, what I want to do now is help understand the significance. How does this matter today? What does it mean today? Okay, let's, let's give it a try. And you may not agree with me. Again, we're all students. students. We're all studying together. And uh, we're doing our best. <laughs> Revelation 13, 11 says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Now, we know who that is, right? It's the United States. I'm not going to get into the proofs of that. You've heard all that. But I think we all agree that's the United States, right? He deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. That's verse 14. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast. Image to the beast. Same character, same purposes. The image is an exact image of the beast. Now, who's the image of the beast? Well, Great Controversy, one of my favorite <laughs> prophetic books. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such point of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant, we call them evangelicals now, evangelicals, will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy. Folks, this hurts. I have evangelical friends. There's a, I have a, I'm very good friends with a Baptist pastor. In fact, it's my wife's stepson. Um, you know, separate. We, we, were, we got married six years ago. Um, and so I have a stepson, stepson-in-law. I love the guy. He's wonderful. We have, we have a lot of values in common. A lot. And we, I enjoy his fellowship. But folks, there comes a day when evangelical America becomes the image of the beast. It's what scripture says. It's what scripture says, folks. We may not like it, but it's what scripture says. You know, scripture always says things we don't, that are unusual that are unexpected, right? The Protestants, evangelicals of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Very, very concerning. Now, now we talked about, we talked about atheism. Let me ask you this. Did atheism die with the French Revolution? Ever heard of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels? German philosophers? They took that. They took every Historian I have ever read says communism came from the French Revolution. It didn't come from anywhere else. Karl Marx, Frederick Engels took the ideas from the French Revolution. They packaged it and spread it to the world. And Russia took it. China took it. Now, I'm a little older than most of you, okay? That's not a good thing, but I am. When I was a teenager, 
communism was on the march. It was, it was gaining converts in Asia. It was gaining converts in Africa. It was gaining converts in Inter-America and South America. And to me, as a 12-year-old, and I was, I was deep into current events at, at 12 years old, it looked to me like it would be the United States and a few countries in Western Europe that would resist communism. It seemed like the whole world was going to... In fact, communism was a religion. And they had, they had this vision of world conquest. It was powerful. Now, communism fell, or sort of. I mean, the, the Soviet Union fell in 1991. But has atheism gone away? You know what's happening today? It's gaining popularity in the Western world. More and more people are ditching their faith. They call it the nuns. Fewer and people go to church. You know, it's not just the Adventist churches that are suffering. You go to, you go to, the, you go to the Baptist, you go to the Methodist churches, they're empty. All right? So, the point is that atheism is a powerful force today. But, what about the religious right today? Now, this is where I'm going to step on some toes, and I apologize, but I have to bring it to the current time. Is the religious right already united with Vatican Rome and their values, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely they are. Now, it hasn't reached a complete fulfillment, right? Not a complete fulfillment. But they are lining up. They are lining up, folks. Now, let me ask you this. Is not the liberal left closely allied with atheistic organizations and values? It is. Do you know that in 2016, the Democratic National Convention invited atheistic organizations into their organization? They're embracing atheism more and more. The intense conflict between the left and the right in the United States, and not just the United States, but in the world, is a fulfillment of the end time conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. That's the significance of this. Amen. Folks, I hate to say it this way, but it's the culture wars that are a fulfillment of these last verses. Isn't that terrible? It's awful. I hate it. Now, what about the United States? Are we united? We're divided. Now, what about the church? Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> I know you're never going to invite me back. I know it. You're going to, I know you're never going to. <laughs> what about the church? Well, let me, let me, let me share with you. Both the atheistic left and the religious right are under Satan's domination. Right? Remember, I said they're both evil. They're both evil. The left came from the depths of the beasts. From, there's a satanic power behind it. But the north has the beast power of Vatican Rome behind it. If we strongly identify and support either, are we not putting ourselves under Satan's, Satan's yes. ground? Yes. Yes. Why? Because we will see things through the lens of the power that we identify with. Instead of seeing the biblical great controversy, we'll see, well, the north is right, the religious right is right, and the left is evil, and the left will say, well, the the religious people are evil. It's a false great controversy. It's a false great controversy. They're both evil. And would we not be in danger of being deceived? Those who support the liberal agenda could be led to dismiss the prophetic end time message. It doesn't apply now. I have read those sentiments. I have read people who are liberal on the liberal side who are pastors, read an article, he said, oh, you know, those prophecies in the Great Controversy, oh, you know, they don't apply anymore. 
That, those prophecies are the result of 19th century bigotry. And I've read those sentiments, folks. But those who strongly support the religious right could also be led to support their agenda, even to the point of supporting a Sunday law. And you think I'm crazy for saying that? I know, and I, I wrote this, I thought, boy, they're going to throw me out. But, but look at this, look at this. Here's where I think we're in danger. We are divided as a church, and we are identifying with the left and the right. We are in danger of being deceived. This is from the Great Controversy, page 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. How could that be? How could that happen? How's, here it is. Matters in nearly the same light. We start to look at things through the, through the lens of the right or through the lens of the left. And guess what? When the crisis comes, we says, says, give up the faith. Jesus says, what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Watch. Study the word. Stay true to the word. The great controversy is clearly described in the Word of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do live in perilous times, and it is so easy for even your disciples to be deceived. Lord, help us to see things through the lens of Scripture and not through the lens of the newspaper, not through the lens of a political party on the left or the right. I pray in Jesus' name. Now, if you want to come back this afternoon, I have one more little segment I could share with you. Um, it takes about 15 minutes, but that's a, but, and I can answer, and also we can go into more detail into those verses all the way down to verse 45, answer any questions about that too, all right? All right, thank you. Remember, we have a lunch waiting for you, and also by 1.30, the uh, second part of this seminar. I, I was deceived by uh, atheism when was I was in, uh, 